So we're going to begin with um, Janet Mann, who is our Vice Provost for Research and a Professor of Biology and Psychology, who will be moderating the program and introducing it and introducing our speakers. Janet. Well, uh, thank you everyone for coming on this rainy morning, and I'm very excited about this panel because, well, two out of three are my colleagues, <laughs> uh, and I'm in biology, and Lisa Singh I work very closely with in computer science. And, of course, since students rely, um, and most of us rely on almost everything for the internet these days, uh, of course our scholarly communications are going to have to increasingly uh, find ways to make our scholarship communicable through the internet. So. Uh, without further ado, we're going to have Anne Rosewold speak first, and she will go for about uh, 20 minutes or so. And then if uh, Dr. Gage shows up from uh, University of Maryland, then he'll go next, and then we the same. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, at first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. Um, And what I'm going to tell you about today, if I can figure out how to do this. You know, I used to use a PC, but I switched to a Mac about two years ago. And now I don't remember anything. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. There you go. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to tell you about is a project that um, I've been working on with um, colleagues in the biology department, as well as colleagues in Candles. And we have a collaboration with people at the J. Craig Venture Institute, which is one of the big sequencing centers, and a colleague at Simmons College in Boston. And so the name of our project is Genome Solver. So here's the outline of my talk. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why we got involved in this. And I'll tell you something about the Human Microbiome Project, which is the, the source of the data that we're using for analysis. And I'll talk more specifically about what we're doing with that data, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So um, this slide came from uh, a report by the Joint Economic Committee Chairman Staff, um, who was chaired by uh, Bob Casey. And what this is showing us is that the projected needs in STEM fields, so for those of you who don't think about this all the time, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Um, and we're going to have needs for lots of people who are trained in, in science and technology coming up within the next decade. Um, however, a smaller and smaller percentage of people are being trained in these STEM fields. So this is coming from the same um, Joint Economic Chairman uh, Committee report. And what you can see is that, you know, if anything we're holding steady, we're certainly not increasing, but for some of these things, we're actually going down. So we're not doing a very good job of parlaying our, our information um, to students coming up through the, the ranks to make sure that they're the upcoming leaders for the next decades. So, um, so I like this, this quote here. It's far easier to be a passive conduit some publisher's materials and to follow shampoo and bottle instruction, lecture test repeat, than to think deeply and thoughtfully about the meaning of one subject and how best to convey that meaning directly and honestly to one student. So if you haven't read this book, it's actually fairly short, and that's Petition's Lament. It's very interesting and talks about how we're doing really a bad job of telling students about the wonder of math. Um, so, but this, this applies, I think, to any STEM field. Um, you know, we're, we're not showing our students that, that STEM fields actually are creative and that um, there's a lot to be learned about the natural world. So, um, so that's how we got involved in, in our project. So the Human Microbiome Project got started about um, seven or eight years ago with a big bolus of money from NIH. And what we've discovered over the last decade or so is that really each of us, um, you're more the things that are on you and in you than you are you. And what I mean by that is that we contain about 10 trillion human cells. So, so the cells that have your DNA in them are about 10 trillion cells in your body. However, the associated microbes in and on your body are about tenfold more abundant. So, so you really are more them than you. Um, 
So what do we know about these organisms? Well, not a whole lot yet, but we're, we're learning more. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is that these microbes have about 100-fold more genes than you do. So in your cells, you have about somewhere around 30,000 genes, depending on how you count. But all of the microbes have about 300,000 genes, which is pretty remarkable. So, um, so the sum total of all the organisms that are associated with humans is defined as the human microbiome. So the important thing to realize here is that we've co-evolved with our microbes over eons. And so most of the microbes that are associated with you are actually there for good, not for bad. Germs, bacteria usually get a bad rap as causing disease. But in fact, most of the ones that are in you and on you are, are there for a reason. They provide vitamins. They provide some um, metabolic activity that you can't do yourself. So in fact, you need those microbes, right? Um, so again, our microbial flora are an integral part of our genetic landscape. And again, relatively few of these microbes really are pathogenic. Of all the bacterial species that have been identified thus far, less than 100 of them are, are pathogenic. Obviously, we, we care about those because they do cause human disease. But um, of the more than 500 bacterial species identified thus far in humans, um, the vast, vast majority are either benign or they are for good. Um, what's been interesting about this, though, is that many of these are pre were previously unknown. And the only way we know them is by DNA sequence analysis, because 99% of the microbes on Earth, actually, we can't grow in the laboratory. We don't know what their conditions for growth are. Um, a lot of them don't grow, for instance, in the presence of oxygen. And so trying to grow them without oxygen is, is kind of a challenge. Um, so by their DNA sequence analysis, we have identified this huge, vast array of new microorganisms. <coughs> OK, so the Human Microbiome Project is trying to understand the, the wealth of different organisms that are found on different um, portions of the human body. So this is listing the, the sites that have been sampled on different individuals. Um, and in summer of 2012, the Human Microbiome Project Consortium um, published 16 papers. The two lead ones were in Nature. So here's one of them. And then here's the other one. And then there were a variety of other journal articles that were published. So the Human Microbiome Project, as, a, um, as an NIH entity, um, a funded entity actually has finished now, but what the work has done is spawned many, many, many more projects, and so the work is ongoing, but not under this umbrella of the consortium. So the overall goals of the Human Microbiome Project are to characterize human microbial communities. Um, 16 sites in and on the human body. Here's a list of those sites. <coughs> And what we're trying to do at this point is look for correlations between the microbiome and human health. Um, what we're finding is that um, perhaps our way of thinking about microbes and their interactions with the human body, it's not just a microbe causing a disease. Rather, it's a change in the population structure of the whole realm of microorganisms at a particular site that causes a problem. So for instance, one you might have heard of, because they use it on Grey's Anatomy a lot, <laughs> is um, Clostridium difficile, C. diff. Has anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. So the idea there is that we all have C. diff in, in and on us. But if we have too many rounds of antibiotics, what happens is that um, you wipe out your normal flora, the ones that are keeping C. diff under control under normal circumstances, it, it can fill all the niches in your gut and take over. So, so it's changes in population structure. So some of the questions we can ask, are people unique with respect to their microbiomes? Um, this was a study done a couple of years ago where, where um, swabs of fingertips were matched with people's keyboards. So, so this is one person, this is another, this is another. So what that says is that at least in a snapshot, um, we have a microbial fingerprint that can be used to identify us. Um, 
whether this persists over time, it's not completely clear yet, but um, people are, are investigating that question. Some other questions we asked, do different body sites have different microbiomes? Yes. Actually, your, your tongue microbiome is more similar to the person sitting next to you than your tongue microbiome is to your gut microbiome, for example. So it's okay to share a toothbrush if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do these sites vary from individual to individual? Yeah, to a certain extent. But again, you know, we, we have signatures that are more characteristic of oral microbiome flora compared to gut, compared to skin, whatever. Um, how stable are these microbial communities over time? We're still investigating this question. Um, we don't exactly know the answer to this, but it looks like they're, for, by and large, that they are relatively stable unless you take a course of antibiotics or something like that. Okay. The other question that people are getting involved in now is does the microbiome vary over the course of human development? Uh, a recent answer to part of this question came out. It was thought that when babies were born, um, they acquired their microbiome from their mother, especially if they were delivered vaginally. Um, but now what we're finding out is that babies actually aren't born sterile. They have their own microbiota in utero, which is, which is actually pretty interesting. So I'll skip over that in the interest of time. So some other questions. Do microbes change upon the development of disease? And in fact, yes, we think that that is true. Um, this is a paper that came out a couple of years ago from Jeff Gordon's lab at Wash U, suggesting that obese people have a different gut microbial ecology than, than thinner people do. It's also been suggested that people who are vegans have a more diverse gut microbiome than, than people who eat a lot of meat. So, um, The other question that we're trying to grapple with here is does a change result in disease? So a lot of Studies like this are correlative. You know, we, we look at somebody with the disease, somebody without, look at differences. But do those differences actually cause the disease? That's kind of what we're grappling with. And the answer is probably, but a lot more work needs to be done. So um, what I, this, this is a plug for a seminar that's coming up in a couple of weeks. We've invited, um, with the help of the biology department, as part of the senior seminar in biology and global health, um, Dr. Martin Blazer is one of the, the um, people who's been intimately involved in studying Helicobacter pylori, which is the, the bacterium that people um, are, have associated with ulcers. But also it turns out if you don't have enough Helicobacter pylori when you're young, you have a higher incidence of developing as, asthma over the course of your life. So he's going to come talk about that. I hope people will come attend that. Lorfink is an auditorium that's very large. We need bodies to fill in. <laughs> um, so I hope you'll come. It'll be really interesting. Okay, so let me now turn my attention to the Genome Solver Project. Um, what we realized is that because we have all of these DNA sequences available so far to study, at this point, most of them have only been studied by computer algorithms, by, by machines. So not very many human eyeballs actually have looked at them and tried to analyze them. Um, so there's about 10,000 prokaryotes in the database right now, bacteria are prokaryotes, from the human microbiome as well as from other environmental samples. Um, many different samples have been sequenced so far, individual organisms, something that's referred to as metagenomes where we try and understand the population structure of all the prokaryotes, all the bacteria that are present in a particular body location or in an environmental site or, or something like that. So that's referred to as metagenomics. Um, these data are available in public databases, but much of it hasn't been analyzed very deeply beyond this automatic gene annotation, it's called. So what genes are there? How do they compare between organisms? This is something that the data are available, and the training that you need in order to investigate this actually is, is something that's very well within the reach of undergraduates, which is how we got involved in this. But a lot of faculty actually are not that interested or, or have, have some reluctance to jump into this because they haven't had the training. So, so there's a potential problem here. Faculty may feel uncomfortable jumping in 
because of lack of training, because they don't know where to access these data, although they're all available in public databases, and lack of support at their home institution. So that's where we got involved in Genome Solver. So here's, here's our beautiful front page, which was de designed by the folks at Camp at um, Candles. So I'd like to acknowledge my, my co-workers here. Laura Aurora is the postdoc of my laboratory. Janet Russell, whom some of you probably know at Candles, and then our collaborator at JCBI, um, the Craig Venter Institute, Ramana Madhu. So we have two parts to the Genome Solver project. One is that we do faculty workshops at the JCBI facility in Rockville over the summer. And this is where people can get some training on how to do this, learn where to get the data, and then they can also develop some face-to-face -face connections. So this is for faculty at primarily undergraduate institutions. We've had folks from community colleges come and do this. Um, this past summer we had a, a man who is an adjunct faculty member at Catholic University, but his, his full-time role is actually to work at the National Center for Biotechnology Information and CBI and NIH. So he, he actually came to learn more about the educational stuff that we were offering, not so much the, the bioinformatics. This, that's the study of, of you know, the intersection of biology and, and computer science. Um, so so we've, we've developed over the last couple of years now a, a fairly large community, about 100 undergraduate educators, that are now having some personal relationships as a result of the workshops, but also having these connections on our Genome Solver website. So we're actually using the internet in two different ways here. One is to do the work because we're using all available tools that are open source that are available through the internet to do the analysis of the DNA sequences. But we're also using the internet in a social media way. This is where the, the different faculty and their students come together and talk to each other. Okay. So then we have this community practice for faculty, students, and experts on the website. So the topics that we cover in the workshop are listed here. I'm not going to necessarily go over all of these, but um, if anybody is interested, I can talk about this in more detail. We use, again, a bunch of tools that are <coughs> available through the internet um, to analyze the DNA sequences. <coughs> um, but the point I want to emphasize here is that this gives an opportunity for undergraduate research. So um, a, a report that came out a couple of years ago from AACU talked about high impact <coughs> practices for learning, or HIPs. And so these, these are the HIPs. And the ones I've outlined in red here are the ones that we think Genome Solver accomplishes. Common intellectual experiences, making a community for learning, we do some writing intensive work, depending on how the individual faculty member structures it. These assignments are collaborative, but, but this is a, a great mechanism for doing undergraduate research. So we think this data firehose is actually an opportunity. There's more data here than the experts can analyze deeply. Students can get involved in genuine research projects. They learn the tools at the intersection of biology, math, and computer science. They can develop hypotheses based on the, the analysis that they've done at the computer. And then this work can actually be extended to do work in the wet laboratory where you're working at the bench. So one of the projects that we did is a pilot project a couple of years ago. We analyzed the sequence of a salmonella <coughs> organism and made predictions about what properties that organism should have. And then we went and tested those in the laboratory. So what we feel like is that this is a win-win-win for, for everybody here, for the experts, for the faculty, and for the students. The experts get some more eyeballs on their data. Um, the faculty get research projects that their students can be involved in. And then the students get involved in original research. It's not camp laboratories. So the hope is that we will um, retain more students who have an interest in science coming in the door to college, at least. And, um, try and address some of those problems that I illustrated in the first couple of slides. So um, just to review, in this project we're using the internet for two aspects. We're using all these online free sequence analysis tools. So really anybody who wants to get involved in this only needs a computer with an internet connection. Um, and we have this online community for sharing ideas and resources. So 
that's where we post the information about the workshops. We have a bunch of classroom exercises there. Um, one thing that we've instituted this year between um, us and Simmons College is to have a virtual journal club where someone picks the paper and then the students at different schools talk about it with each other online on the Genome Solver site. Um, and we also can post student research efforts there. Um, so, concluding thoughts. We need to get more students interested in STEM subjects and we need to retain them in the pipeline. One way to do this is to get them involved in, in authentic research projects. Bioinformatics research, this intersection of biology and math and computer science, with this huge data set that's available and tools that are accessible to all, could be one way to do that. So um, I'd just like to thank the, the GM Solver team. Uh, Gaurav Ramana Jenna is the, folk, the person at, at Simmons, and Janet. Um, I have a couple students who are working in the laboratory now on a, a project that we're developing, <coughs> taking some of this data and um, looking at uh, commonalities between different bacteria. Um, the web design team, the, the web, most of this work is done by Justin Secor, who's no longer at Candles, but our current webmaster is Marie Selvanadin, and the funding for this project comes from the National Science Foundation. So that's, that's it for me. and then uh, if Dr. Gates comes. <laughs> Hopefully the sun is out a little bit, maybe that's help with traffic. Um, then we'll let him go and then we'll continue our questions after. So thank you very much, that was fabulous. collaborating for a number of years and so some of the examples that I'm going to use today are uh, from our joint project. Um, in fact, the majority of the examples are from our joint project. Before I really get started about some of the opportunities and challenges associated with using the internet for um, scholarly dissemination, um, I would like to kind of um, remind us about the value of the internet. So, there's more than 2.4 billion internet users. Um, and if we break that down a little bit, we have uh, the majority of them in Asia, about 1 billion. We have uh, the next set from Europe, it's about a half a billion users in Europe. And then um, in the third spot is North America with about 225 million users. So that's a huge population of users that are on the internet. We're even seeing that um, the internet is in a lot of different, um, it's all over, it's not everywhere we expect it to be, but um, there's population everywhere. So um, if we look at the North America population in particular, 78% of North Americans um, use the internet. That is the largest in terms of population penetration of any of the areas around the world. Um, the next largest <coughs> after, um, after North America is Europe and that is followed by um, Australia. So those are the three for penetration. Since 2000, the internet oh, <laughs> usage has grown over 560%, which is a pretty big number. Um, and in the US, it's grown about 100, or sorry, North America, it's grown about 150%. 
um, which is small compared to certain other regions. The largest region of growth is Africa, where it's grown over 3,000%, um, and then the Middle East, where it's grown over 2,000%, and then Latin America, where it's grown over 1,000%. So in those areas where there's a lot of geopolitical tension and where the infrastructure isn't as strong, we're seeing a lot more growth now because technology has, has advanced enough that we can do things without having the heavy infrastructure we needed a decade ago. Okay, so let's get to the question that we're asking ourselves, which is how do we access this internet population to share and enhance our scholarship? And what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with some of the opportunities uh, that exist there. Um, specifically, I'm going to start out talking about the Shark Bay Research Project, which really Janet should be talking about, but I'm going to get it my attempt, and there's one point at which I'm going to, I think she'll give a little bit more insight than me, so, um, so I'll do that. So I've been working on this project with her, she's been working on it for decades, I've been working on this project with her um, for seven years or so now at this stage. Um, there's an international team of scientists that work on this project, and they've been studying the wild albinos dolphins in Monkey Mia, Australia since 1982. Um, Monkey Mia, Australia is on the western part of Australia. Uh, it's near Perth. They do a lot of different research. Um, they're, they're scientists from a lot of different disciplines. But some of the projects include female reproduction and in calf care, tool usage, hunting behavior, transmission of some of these hunting tactics, ecology, social dynamics, and social networks, just to name a few of them. Okay, so um, the first obvious way for dissemination, we all know it's the first thing that you should do, is you should make a, a website for your project. And I really think one thing that our project, this project that Janet um, is the head of, so by no means do I claim to be the head of this project, but this project, um, I think one of the things it does particularly well is it has, has created a website where researchers from around the world that are part of this project are integrated in this website. And that's a huge deal because I have my own personal website, Janet has her own personal website, but we can't have everybody else's stuff on our website. So having a project-based website really makes a difference. So if we look at this particular one a little bit more, um, we, um, there's always, uh, you start out here and you get an overview of the project, all the recent news is publicized on the side, and there's a lot of different tabs that we have information about. One is research, of course, you should have your research. The other is the field site and the dolphins, what we're studying, the people that are involved in the project. Photos and videos are huge. I'm going to talk a lot about visualization and the importance of actually showing not only the results of your research, but part of your research as you're conducting it. Um, the media. So this particular project has gotten a, a lot of media attention, and I didn't want to get it wrong, so I did write it down. So there's been over 20 natural history films from National Geographic, PBS, ABC, Fox, Discovery, BBC, um, there's been um, a lot of film and TV interviews, um, public, public uh, TV appearances um, or mentions on Good Morning America and um, MSNBC, lots of radio interviews, and it was also selected as one of the innovative stories um, in the year 2005. So this um, is a great way to show all the media attention and put it together in one spot. Um, we also have a part for kids, and I'm going to spend a little time focusing on this because um, it's not just about for kids. I think I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about what Anne was talking about, which is research and teaching really do go hand in hand now. They're not two separate things. We really need to think about teaching our research and using the internet as a platform to teach our research, not only to kids, but to a broader audience that just might be interested, as well as to other colleagues who might want to try a new technique in their lab, but don't know how to go about it. So it gives us an opportunity to teach that we didn't have before. Um, and I think we're fortunate to have that now. So I'm going to start with um, 
a particular kids application that Janet and I um, jointly developed, and it was developed in the computer science department. So one form of dissemination was the web. Our second form of dissemination is through education modules and games. And specifically, what we want to do is we want to share and teach our research using the internet. And by doing this, we're really going to increase the dissemination of new ideas rapidly, as opposed to waiting for it to come out in textbooks, as opposed to people citing our research in our normal traditional publication, um, publication cycle. OK, so FinNet. What is FinNet? It is an it is a education module. Um, it is an education module with the sole purpose of teaching more complex biological concepts and computer science concepts that are not taught to middle school and high school kids in their traditional curriculum. And so what we decided was, if you know anything about computer science education in the middle school and high school curriculum, it's horrible. Okay? <laughs> Biologists are fortunate, chemists, chemistry, physics, very fortunate. You guys get a whole year, very, very lucky. We get nothing, um, and we have to like that. Um, and not only do we get nothing in the high school, it's all optional, we get nothing in elementary school and we get nothing in middle school. Typing, that's computer science. So <laughs> your kids will be good typers, but I don't know that they'll understand <laughs> computer science. Um, so we thought that what, since kids have a natural liking of dolphins and animals, perhaps there would be a smart way to teach computer science concepts and non-traditional biology concepts within the context of these dolphins. And that's what FinNet was about. Um, it was about trying to do that. And, and this, is, this is kind of an out-of-the-box way to think, because what we had to do was think about um, concepts that were simple enough for middle school and high schoolers to grasp, while at the same time important enough that they're really using some of these um, computational thinking skills that we want them to develop. Right? So there's kind of this, this hybrid that has to occur. So we created two different parts, one that was a learning modules part, one that was an explore area, and we um, basically picked concepts for each of these modules in both disciplines. So as an example, we have, um, we are interested in dolphins. So uh, as, as um, a scientist studying a dolphin society, you're interested in the dolphin social networks for a lot of different reasons. As a computer scientist, you're interested in graphs, and you're interested in paths that go through these graphs and understanding how to find different types of paths. And so here's an example where uh, we have this module where we're teaching them about not only um, any path that exists, but about shortest paths that exist, because that could be um, a very important concept even for biology. It could give us insight into disease transmission. How fast can this disease propagate through this population? But it is also a graph theory concept that you might not get in your traditional um, um, curriculum. And if we can teach you some algorithmic thought around that, you can get it as a computer science concept as well. So this was the idea behind FinNet. It was about structured learning and teaching, using the internet to allow teachers to, when they have extra time one day in class, to just use this. So this is on the internet. They can go on this. They can go on our site and um, just use it and interact with it. We've had the opportunity to test this out in a few high schools, and it's been um, we made iterations to improve certain parts, but it's been um, it's been well received. Okay, so along with um, teaching them concepts that we think are important, <coughs> like homophily and and shortest paths and other things like that, um, we also want to teach them how to conduct science. Uh, and and one of our thoughts was to see if we could develop a game that would somehow map to some type of process, research process that already exists. So one of the things that's time consuming um, when you're studying dolphins, and I've learned this only through Janet, because I have not actually done this task myself, uh, is to identify and match dolphins when you're observing them. And the way that you match dolphins are through their dorsal fins. Those are, that's kind of their identification. But those dorsal fins do change through time you know, shark bites and other things that can happen, they grow and so forth. Um, and so what we wanted to do was we started with the idea of, well, um, let's let kids actually attempt to match dorsal fins, and let's do this first in the context of a game. So we had this, 
This game is also online, and all it is, it's just a basic match and concentration type game where you're just trying to match the dorsal fins that exist. And when you do get a match, it, it puts the match down here, and it you can find out more about that particular dolphin if you're interested. And it gets progressively harder. So you start out, and it's actually a, an exact match of the same image. Then um, at the next level, it's the same dolphin, but they're very the images are close in time. And then it's the same dolphin after that, but the images are a little further in time. So, um, so it's progressively different. Um, Janet's played this game so that we have um, a, a assessment of what the best time should be. <laughs> um, although some of her students may have beaten her at this stage. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we needed to know how long this actually took people. Um, but what this also did was this gave it, so it, it's nice that it's a game. It's teaching them the science of, of actually understanding what she does in the field and what people in her lab do in the field. It teaches this process. But the other thing it did for us is it gave us a grander idea, which is, you know what? This is a, a labor-intensive process that exists in her lab. Maybe we can use some type of a citizen science type environment to actually help with our catalog, with the cataloging of uh, dorsal fins. So, um, so it's something we're exploring. We haven't gotten there yet, but uh, this is how our ideas keep generating as we're using the internet and we're seeing what people are doing with some of the applications that are being developed. Okay, so now I'm gonna veer away a little bit from this project uh, because I think there are some other important, oh no, I'm not veering away yet, <laughs> sorry. Dissemination through YouTube and online videos. Okay, so this is something that um, Janet deserves full credit for because I have nothing to do with this part. But they do a number of online videos um, that are, are used to show how different um, uh, show different results and, and also to show what life how you how uh, I don't know. I'm not gonna. I, I'm not sure that I'm saying this correctly, but. For this particular video, um, Eric, who's one of her former students and now postdoc, is he postdoc? Research assistant professor. Research assistant professor um, was doing something in Shark Bay, and I'm going to let Janet describe it as the video is going. All right, let me stop it for a second because oh. it's better to give a little setup. For okay. It. Um, so uh, some of the dolphins that are field site use marine sponges as tools. And it's deep, so we can't see what the dolphins are doing underwater uh, that well. But we know they change their sponge, they put them on their face, and then we know they use them on the seafloor. We want to find out what prey they were going after. We knew they were foraging, but we couldn't, um, you could, we don't swim with them, we wash them from the boat, we couldn't quite see what they were scaring up off the bottom with the sponges. So we decided to be, do human sponging, and if we put the sponges on our face, that wouldn't work so well. <laughs> um, so we just put the sponges on the end of a pole, and we went in their areas where the, they use the sponges as tools, and then did matching areas where they, um, that are the same depth, but nobody ever sponges over there, as we call it. play behind you. Right, so this is showing, um, uh, is a video Eric sponging in. This is a sponge habitat. Um, and so we had dogs that went down there. That's not one of the fish that they eat, but it should show some of the, that's not what they go after with the sponges. But where are we in the video? There, there's actually the prey that they go after. It's a paraperchus. Uh, and we've actually matched it up with poo samples, which we can like the dolphin poo. <laughs> We have ca captured these fish. They're really easy to catch, but you never, you, we never even see them without using the sponge. There's so a you, sponge example. Yeah, like so you use the sponge along the seafloor. We also scare up other stuff, stingrays, <laughs> and there's, um, uh, there's, I think that might be another paraperchus. But um, there are other things we scare up, but we also looked at if you just swim along the bottom, you just don't see ever the pair of purpose, which is barred sand perch is what it is. Um, so it matches up, there it is again. Because uh, they're very well camouflaged and they actually sit on the bottom and are hidden. So it helped us discover what we've been wondering about for 30 years now, like why do dolphins use tools and, you know, when they're eating. And um, yeah, so this was how we figured that out. So 
Hearing Janet's description is awesome, but hearing her description with a YouTube video is that much better, right? Because you can say, oh, well, you put it on a stick. Well, what type of stick? And, you know, how did that actually work? So I think it's, I think it's a great way to help other researchers see how she's conducting this research and to actually show the results for their lab so they know, um, in fact, which fish were coming up and were being scared up. And there's a lot of interesting things about those fish if you go to any of her students' um, talks, you'll, you'll hear a lot of interesting things. Okay, um, and one thing that we overlook a little bit is just the idea that we really should be using the internet to just do traditional things as well. So you write a book, you really should use the internet to publish or, or to, to um, promote your book and have a link to Amazon and, and, and put some blurbs about it and, and things like that. So Janet has a number of books. This is, this is a, a kid's book, if I remember correctly. And um, sharing the book online and sharing different parts of it and then showing people how they can get access to it, I think is an, per, a, an important way for us as scholars to get our research um, out as it's well. It's out this month, by the way. It's not this is out this month, and I, didn't even, I wasn't even attempting to promote. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's not what I've seen. It's by Pamela Turner, but it's about our work. Right. Okay. So there are other opportunities that I'd like to talk about that have been very successful within computer science um, that maybe some other disciplines don't use as much. Uh, one of them is blogs. So I have to tell you, when blogs first started, I thought they were a horrible idea. People telling their whole life stories up there, it's just <laughs> horrible. Like, what about the privacy of their lives? This is not something they should be doing. But in fact, now blogs have evolved to an area where, yes, you're telling a story, but you can tell a story about anything. It doesn't have to be about your life. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah. well, I know a lot of people are still using it to tell stories about your, their lives, but um, I'm a privacy researcher as well, so I can sort of buy um, some of the things I get put online. Uh, so I'm going to give you two examples of faculty that I think have done a particularly nice job with blogs. Um, one of them is an assistant professor um, at Princeton, um, Arvind uh, Nayari, uh, no, Narayanan, sorry. I, I knew someone else and I was getting myself confused. Okay, and so he is a new breed of scholar. And let me explain to you why he's a new breed of scholar. A lot of people thought he would not get an academic position because he tweeted very frequently how arcane the system of academia was in its evaluation. Um, and so when he got a position at Princeton, that was quite a big shock to a lot of people, but he does tremendous research. And he believes that when you have a research result, you should disseminate it right away. You shouldn't wait till it's published. You shouldn't take two years to get it out through the cycle. You should publish it right away. And that's exactly what he does. He has major results that he puts on his blog before they ever get to publication. Could that mess him up? Could somebody else? Yeah, it could. But I think we're going towards a generation where we really want to get our ideas out faster. And we want to get them out in a timely manner. And so, um, so that's what his blog is. He posts approximately once every month or two. It's not that big a time commitment on his part. But he puts his ideas out there as soon as they come so people can comment on them. They can have a debate about them. They can see what is good and what is bad. And I think that's a great new way to think about sharing um, our scholarship and enhancing our scholarship because those who are interested are the ones that are going to comment and um, give ideas and share ideas. Okay, so this is one great example um, of a research blog. We actually have a very prolific blogger here in our department at Georgetown in the computer science department. Uh, his name is Cal Newport. He does not blog about his research. What he blogs about is teaching, it, what he blogs about is productivity. His goal is to teach people how to be productive. Um, and he has been blogging since 2007. And I want to use his case example um, because I think it's really, really an interesting one, and I have a few statistics about, um, about it. 
Um, he posts once a week. So his time commitment is a little bit larger. So once a week, he has a community of over 120,000 unique users who look at his blog every month. Okay, that's a huge community. That's like a small, um, that's like the Howard County Times. That's their circulation, okay? Um, it's a very similar type of idea. He's getting his idea of, out to a lot of different people. Um, he has approximately, okay, he's written 573 articles during that time and has approximately 20,000 comments on these articles. So these are conversations that are happening. Um, he's engaging an audience, he's disseminating his ideas. I think this is really, really powerful, and I think it's a new medium that we shouldn't ignore. We don't need to put our life stories up there. We just <laughs> need to use it in the purposes that are, are better for our, the population we want to um, influence. Okay, so that's a little bit about blogs. Let's talk about Twitter, okay? Another thing that I'm not a huge fan of necessarily, but it has been used successfully in certain ways. So, so let's talk about Twitter a little bit. Um, there's 550 million active users. Huge, huge number. Huge, huge number. Um, there's 9,100 tweets per minute that are sent. No, 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 sorry, per second that are sent. 9,100 tweets per second. Just, I mean, for me, tweeting, I don't have time for it, so I think we'll talk about the challenges of time in just a minute, but that's a lot. Um, now, the largest mm -hmm. penetration is in the U.S., but it is only 8% of the U.S. users, which is kind of an interesting uh, number. It's not as prevalent in the U.S., but internationally, it's much more prevalent, and so it's very important for an international um, base a little bit. 25% um, of Twitter users check their tweets several times a day. That's also a very disturbing statistic. In certain ways. But <laughs> it would be against Cal's productivity um, law. Right there. But, um, but yeah, so, so it's, a, it's, it's very popular. Um, but one thing about tweets, and, and so I, I don't say get on Twitter, because 71% of all tweets get no comments. Okay? So um, unless you can be an information broker and you're going to invest in this medium, you're not going to do very well with it. Having said that, there are people who have been very successful in computer science um, and who have a good following and when they post things, they get a lot of feedback according to, according to. So here's an example of Neil Gunther. Um, he is a an academic, but he's also, like most computer science professors, got involved in, uh, in uh, a startup. Um, he um, tweets pretty regularly. He gets a lot of comments back. He has um, almost 7,000 tweets, so that's pretty regular. Uh, he has 1,300 followers, which is small when you compare it to the millions that Obama has, but it actually creates a community. These are people who are very interested in his idea and will further disseminate his idea behind them, uh, beyond them, to their, to their followers. But the thing I like about his Twitter account that I think is fabulous is he has a lot of photos and videos, including ones that teach algorithms. Um, so he actually puts pictures and says, here's a new algorithm, here's a, here's a, new, um, a new thought that we have, and here's some support for this thought. He just tweets it out really quickly. Okay. And, and I think that that can be very powerful for his audience. He can tell his students to follow him. People at conferences know him. They start following him. And suddenly his ideas are getting out right away as they're getting published. Okay. So um, I'm going to kind of go a little bit of a different direction because I do a lot of work with visual analytics. And I feel very strongly about how useful visualizations are. Um, kids and college students and people who are of a younger generation are used to pretty pictures. They just are, um, and they like them. People who come to my coding classes really dislike the fact that it's just this big set of text. <laughs> it's just horrible. Okay? But it, it, it's true that in order to get ideas across effectively, visualizations can really, really help. So I want to describe 
three, briefly describe three visualizations um, that I think are, were very powerful. So this is the Dolphin Society. Again, it's a, it's a piece of the Dolphin Society. And we were looking actually at spongers and how, um, how they um, are distributed through um, this set of dolphins. And what we found was, in fact, the spongers cluster into, uh, not all into one group, but into a subset of these groups. Um, and so this visualization was very powerful in showing um, some of those clusters. Anyone want to take a guess about this? <laughs> I can't guess, right? I haven't given you any information. So this is actually the dissemination of a single tweet. Right? So here is Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> <laughs> that takes someone famous. Um, and these are all the individuals who retweeted that tweet. And if you assume each of these individuals has at least 100 followers, this was a particular message. And interestingly enough, it was about health care, but it was a few years ago, uh, that disseminated very well. The different colors show you um, how far the different nodes are from this initial node. Yeah. So you get a sense. And what you can actually see is there's, there's a grouping up there that started disseminating because of one individual. And that one individual that seemed to kind of propagate more dissemination of this particular message was actually Ron Paul. <laughs> yeah. What does distance indicate on that? Uh, the, the distance is only in terms of the number of hops. It's not in terms of, um, the, it's just for the visualization um, that we have longer versus shorter lengths in, within a single hop. Yeah, just to make it pretty. It actually, it's not only make it pretty, the other thing that it shows, well, we were trying to understand, understand information flow on Twitter, net, on, 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 on Twitter and one of the things we wanted to understand was whether or not um, most of the communities that were on Twitter were very clustered communities or whether they had a lot more weak type ties that were good for information dissemination and propagation. And what we found was messages that propagated well tended to have what we call this octopus type look where there were these things that were going out more than instead of these um, clusters of individuals that were closed communities. Okay, so this is another, again, this, this visualization has power to it that me telling you that wouldn't have. Oh, Nancy Pelosi's message disseminated to this many people. Yeah, it might mean something, but it might not. And then, I love graphs, but sometimes we need to veer away from graphs. Um, there are so many tools that exist now on the internet. You just plug in a few words, you put in the percentages, and you can get beautiful word clouds out. This is easy for us to do now, and we should. We should take advantage of this. So um, I was running an NSF workshop, and it was the um, information. It was it was one. Of, it was the III group that was associated with this workshop, and um, these are all the different topics that researchers that were being funded by this group felt were going to be the next set of research topics um, that NSF should fund. So this is a nice word cloud for them so they can see what the researchers they're funding now think they should be funding in the future. Challenges, of course. Time, time, time. I can't do all these things. My suggestion, pick two or three things at most and do them well. And accept the fact that you're going to either blog, you're going to tweet, you're going to do um, something, but doing it all is impossible. There's too many methods right now that exist. Learning new technologies can be challenging, but in fact, it's not nearly as challenging as it was a decade ago. There are so many tutorials out there. There are so many ways to learn a lot of these new technologies. This presentation I'm giving today is a Prezi presentation. It is only the second Prezi presentation I've ever made. But the first one I made, I made it in 2009, and there were no templates. It took me days and days and days to create this. Um, it was a food informatics presentation that looking back on it now, which I finally did after many years, was lousy. Like, you know, it was, it was trying to use the Prezi, but it took so long just to create bullets. Imagine PowerPoint without templates, right? That's what Prezi was back then. And now you go to Prezi, this is a template that I used, right? So now there's all these additional tools that you can use, and the learning curve isn't nearly what it used to be um, before. 
So um, kind of to wrap up, the Internet give, gives us the ability to collaborate with colleagues to find others who are interested in similar research and to disseminate our results very, very rapidly. I think as researchers and scholars, we really want to make sure we don't miss the opportunity that's there. So that's it. Thanks. the library, there's lynda.com, which actually has a tutorial for Prezi, because when I saw Lisa's presentation, I thought, this is a great thing, and so I went to see if Linda had it, and sure, it does. So you could all learn Prezi through the tutorial. <laughs> Otherwise, I was going to have Lisa teach me, which would be a waste of her time. Anyway. I don't think I would have. Yeah, she was going to do the tutorial. Just figure it out. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is ask the panel members to come up, and uh, join us because I don't think I know Dr. Gates had to leave at 11. So <laughs> he's, he's here so fast. <laughs> so um, why don't you come up and then we'll move. we'd like to take questions from everybody and I'll also decide. So I have a real question. But I also have a, a sponge question. <laughs> Sponges are live beings. It's yes. an animal. It yes. is an animal. So what happens to the sponges um, after the dolphins have used them as tools? They die. <laughs> <laughs> that was... They, so they're not... Um, yeah. They're already dead, though, before they use them. No, no. They're already no. dead? No. They pull them off and probably alive for a little while. Oh, I just assumed they were dead. <laughs> <She's not laughs> <alive. laughs> I don't like the dolphins' living behavior. Yeah. Some of the things I tell her about dolphins, she doesn't like. But, yeah, we, and we don't know if they're that environmentally friendly. In fact, you know, so one idea is like, what, you know, because if they are they depleting the sponges, in this area of the sponges grow. But yes. So, so the other question I have is um, about the use of the internet for the dissemination of ideas and something that Lisa said and something that Anne said made me think of um, a sort of prototype among physicists and astronomers in particular um, called Archive, A-R-X-I-V, yeah. which, right, which you as scientists would know a lot about. And it's a great way to get information out very rapidly because we know science builds upon science and the faster it gets out there the better it is. A good thing about archive it seems is that you're not um, necessarily exposing yourself in a bad way when there is a large community of practice and scholars. Um, you then become known as the person who first set out XYZ idea and, and so you're not likely to get scooped the way maybe um, you mentioned that the blog poster might so um, archive, you can if you use that, you can actually cite it in real papers. Correct. And so that is one big difference. Blogs are harder to cite. Right, and it's like a preprint in a way. Right. Um, but the other comment, I guess that Anne made, or maybe it was you, Lisa, is um, no, actually, maybe it was you. <laughs> is um, is citizen science? Was that you? Yeah. yeah. So citizen science, um, could you talk a little bit about that? Because I know that there are many sites out there. One that I looked at recently was called Galaxy Zoo. And interested lay people contribute to the dissemination of science through the internet. And I wondered if you would talk about that. Yeah, um, um, our, our site actually isn't citizen science, although it could be, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing keeping anyone from joining it, they don't have to be associated with a college or university. Um, I did meet some people, I got invited to give a talk at the North Carolina Academy of Sciences meeting last year, and I met some folks down there who do citizen science on the human microbiome. So they have a project, it's it's the museum in Raleigh, uh, the Science Museum of North Carolina, I think it's called. Um, but they have a citizen science project where they ask people to um, get samples from their underarm you know, when they wore to and when they didn't. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it sounds kind of ew, but, um, <laughs> but, but they really got a lot of people involved in that project, um, and there's there's tons of ways that you could go with that. Um, so we've been talking to them about becoming a presence on our site. Um, haven't gotten there yet, but, but we're, we're definitely thinking along the lines. Yeah, there's, there's a huge number of citizen science projects that exist, and it's growing very rapidly. 
I think the ones that you see in the context of computer science are much more about um, individual movement and trying to understand, like, uh, people will have their mobile phones and they'll give access to it and they'll talk about access patterns of individuals when they're driving so you can reduce congestion and other things like that. A lot of, there's a driving app that a lot of people use here, Wave, right, so Waze. Waze, right, Waze, and that's all citizen science, right? It's people telling individuals or, or telling this program where they're at and it's a form of citizen science so that I can avoid certain paths in my, in my commute here. They're it's been, very powerful. Yeah, there have been some other really successful ones, like birders who are obsessed with that. Yeah. And that's been, a, that's been a huge project yeah. with, um, you know, looking at migration patterns of birds and where um, depleted. Butterflies. Yeah, yeah. And, and animals are being depleted. Or others where uh, people contribute, again, to their iPhones, like, because they, they have their uh, GPS location. And so you can take a picture of an animal that you sighted and, and, send, and just send it. Um, to these citizen science, especially in remote areas where people don't know where these animals are, and there's very little, you know, obviously individual scientists can't go out and cover the amount of land that everybody else is covering, and so then they upload it, somebody has to verify, and then they can look at species distributions, um, and even some of them who are higher level can do tracks, and so that they will say, well, I'm going to walk this track or this trail and record these certain things. And so some people get more and more, as they get more into it, start becoming more systematic and actually become observers in the field. And uh, it, it's a great contribution. Are you all familiar with the Folded Project at University of Washington? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they used gamers. Yeah. Thousands and thousands that's, that's of gamers. A great project. Then they were folding proteins. Yeah. Um, and they <laughs> solved uh, problems with AIDS that researchers haven't been able to, to solve for decades. And I, I actually tried that. I got stuck at about level 14. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, not doing this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the gamers beat the uh, scientists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah. One. yeah. In the back. I, I'm not sure I'll use the right language, but um, the studies, but the experimental trials that they've done with the introduction of fecal, um, materials to try to repopulate the gut mm -hmm. biome. Mm -hmm. Can you talk at all a little bit more about that or is that? Yeah, yeah. So, so the notion is that if you have a, um, a C. diff infection, so, so the symptoms of that are chronic diarrhea that, that antibiotics won't touch. And so one therapy that they've come up with is to get a fecal transplant from somebody that you live with. Um, so that you would have those microbes that are um, similar to what you should have had, mm -hmm. right? Um, so those have been shown in clinical trials actually to be fairly effective, but now the FDA has gotten involved and in how is this going to be regulated, you know? So, so there's obviously issues about how you prepare the samples, how, you know, what, what the composition is, um, how this this all gets sort of regularized, so so it's still kind of a big controversy about how this is going to be put forward in a way that um, that can be a, a standard therapy. I think they talked about it also expanding it to things like maybe obesity you mentioned and some yeah. other yeah change your microbes to make you fit yeah yeah, yeah. 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 rather than those fat efficient um, microbes yeah. <laughs> the ones that yeah. the tone yeah. Yeah, I had a, a question about research, social media, and peer review. And uh, I thought of this when you mentioned, Lisa, the Princeton professor who was blogging out his research immediately. Uh, is that the peer review process, that he's blogging and then everybody's commenting and... Uh, no, it's not peer review process. No. <laughs> so how does that figure into scholarship and what did promotion and tenure committees say about social media and... That's another host yeah. of questions, but yeah. Yeah. How, how does social media figure into peer review? I guess I'll just put yeah. that. Yeah, so, um, so that's a great question. It's a great question. And my initial thought is the following. Um, if we think about um, scholarly activities and we think about what we would put into a, a tenure case, if my, art, if my research is picked up by the New York Times, um, 
we, I would put that in my in my um, case in my in my packet, um, but it wouldn't have the same weight as if I was publishing in the top journal in my area. So I'm not necessarily saying that it should be equal to being in the top journal in the area, but I do think it deserves perhaps equal weight as something like a New York Times article on my research, where there were um, you know, 200,000 individuals who looked at this, and I'm getting 50 comments per um, article that I, I'm generating. I, I'm, I'm helping a community understand new ideas. I'm getting those ideas out right away. Um, whether or not I fully publish it in terms of in a traditional way, it becomes a question because once the idea is out there, then a newer idea might beat my publication out. So you're taking a risk, but I think, I think we should count it in some way. I think there should be a mechanism to incorporate the effort that it takes to put that information out and the fact that so many people are interested in that information that they're willing to kind of um, collaborate with the idea, it's building a community. Those are things that I think we should consider. Yeah. And, and there is this thing called altmetrics that the library community has been looking at for a long time. Alternative metrics to do just such things to say the impact factor of journal articles. And, um, and peer review remains terribly important, but, but I think as younger scholars are much more um, developing social media and other sorts of things, these all metrics really have to be taken into consideration. And then you weigh the importance of, say, in, in the New York Times article as opposed to something on an archive or something like that. Right. But they won't, the Times journals won't publish it if it's already out. Yeah, a lot that's of right. That's that's right. right. So that is, that's yeah. the thing that you've done. That, that that's it. So so I, I do think also um, it, it has to be weighed in a little different way as well. Which is um, if I'm expected to have ten high quality articles, I can't have ten high quality articles and maintain a blog every week. Sure. Also, <laughs> so that number maybe needs to be reduced a little um, to make sure that I have time for this other form of dissemination that's timely, that builds communities, and that is part of a, a kind of a broader mission of a university right. to get your ideas out. Right. I mean, that's my first question. Another related question about the kind of the concept of comprehensiveness. You said that people can't do all things all the time, but it seems like that has the potential to fracture the community a little bit as well. And you know, you have this idea, of, have you seen all the research in a particular area, how do you know? And I'm like, well, how does anybody know anymore? Just mm -hmm. wonder if you sure. might say something about that. Yeah, I, I think that's a huge problem. I mean, I, I spend, it's, it seems like I'm spending more and more of my time trying to figure out where stuff is. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult, I think, because you can't just look to the traditional journal articles anymore. Even though I have to say that getting to journal articles is way easier than it used to be. When I was in graduate school, we all had our journals that we were assigned, and everybody read the table of contents for your journal, and then you Xeroxed it for everybody in the lab. And, you know, so at least we had Xerox machines. But, um, <laughs> but, but now, you know, um, I'll just share one little anecdote. I'm, I'm taking a MOOC in my spare time just to see what that's like. But it's about it's about um, music in the Western world, and um, so. We have to write these little papers that get peer reviewed, and for this assignment this week, they said we couldn't use Wikipedia. So I, so while I was over here in the library, I actually got some books to, to do my assignment with. But it um, just just you know the amount of material that's out there, um, like right now, you can get any recording for any piece of classical music. You can look at the score for any piece of classical music online. That's amazing to me. I hadn't really dipped into that area in a long time. But the stuff that's available now is just massive. And so waiting through it to get the material that you need, I think, is, is getting harder and harder. So uh, I, I'm going to take a little different point of view on this. Um, I think 30 years ago, there were fewer people in each research area as well. Or that at least we knew of fewer people. There were the few dominant groups and many of the other researchers you just never knew. But what 
the internet has allowed us to do is to actually get access to everybody's thoughts, not just the few that are the leading scholars in the area. So as a consequence of that, there's too much out there, right? I mean, there's just too much. We can't possibly figure out what's all good and what's all bad. But I think that's because we're in the Wild West mode right now, where we haven't figured out what the two or three best things are that we should be promoting our scholarship through. Um, and we won't know that because we don't know who's going to succeed in the internet corporate world. So it's hard for us to decide what's going to succeed in the academic world, in my opinion. So, so I think this will actually get a little easier, but not for a little bit of time. Yeah. I was, Lisa, I was really disturbed by your comment about computer science in school. I mean, I was a computer science minor back in the days when you couldn't major in computer <laughs> science. And, um, you know, at that time, it was like 10% of women. In the early 80s, it went up to 25, and now it's back down to about 15. <coughs> and it's approaching 20, but yeah. But not fast enough. Uh, yeah. And it's really, it was really disturbing to me um, about your comment of, of computer science in the high schools is just, it is so voluntary. And, you know, what, what can we do to, to affect that? Um, so there are a number of computer science faculty who have come together to work on a curriculum for the high school level. So that's, that is one positive step. I think ultimately the largest problem um, for computer science in um, middle school and high school is the fact that there aren't enough teachers. The people who are currently teaching it are teachers of other disciplines, and they do it on the side, so they don't do a particularly good job, which then scares away people away from computer science, and then particularly women. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's still the stereotype that the computer scientist is this you know, guy with acne all over his face, sitting in front of a computer that stinks. Somewhere on the autism spectrum. <laughs> what? Somewhere on the autism spectrum. There you go. There you go. And so this is still the stereotype today. It hasn't changed. And um, that's just not what the labor force is in computer science. It's a very different labor force. And we need to get new images out. We need to show them that it's not all about just programming. There is a whole way of thinking that is very different and very important to not only computer science, but to other disciplines as well. Yeah, so it's a big problem. I think there are small steps being taken towards improving it. Um, I'm always involved in things like that. We did a, a workshop this summer that was teaching computer science um, to high school teachers. And, we, our, and Google sponsored that. Google has a very large program that focuses on trying to get faculty to go back and give back to the high school. <coughs> so there are things that are that the computer science um, community is attempting to do. It's just too slow. Yeah. It's just too slow. Yeah. Like I would like sorry, I would like to you guys are gonna freak out when I say this, but I would actually like to make computer science a requirement for every undergraduate here at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And I have said this before and people have looked at me like you've lost your mind. And you know, maybe I have, but um, I think it's very important to so, anyway, so. Um, going back to this issue of blogs and peer review, what do you um, could you comment on open access journals and how you think they fit into scholarship? And is the, is are they mediums or should they be considered more like peer review? And then again, how does that look in a tenure packet? Um, so I, I think that's going to be very field oriented to some extent. So I can try it first, and then you guys can talk about it the, from the tenure. So the thing about open access is, um, is it's great. It's a, it's a great idea. Um, it's expensive, um, so it's not as as cost effective as a non open access um, venue, uh, and it's all dependent on the impact factor. It is truly dependent on that, in my opinion, um, from what we've seen in computer science. Um, in computer science, if you do an open access journal or, or, or um, you use an open access journal that is not has a low impact factor, it counts much less than um, a traditional computer science journal that might have 
close to the same impact factor, which seems a little counterintuitive for computer science, but that's that's kind of where it's at. In computer science, we just um, we're very set on conferences. We have a whole different model of the journals conference model, and conferences are quick dissemination for us, and so those tend to have the highest impact factors. Journals are still good in our world, but they're not as big as they are in other worlds. So I, I think open access is still out. I, I think you know, Plus One has done very well in its impact factor, and I think people are starting to recognize that as a very important open source um, venue. But a lot of other open, open access journals have not done nearly as well. Um, I think in biology, I mean, at least in you know, the molecular biology realm, I think they're, they're fairly well accepted at this point. Um, they do have decent impact factors, although there's a, a groundswell of, of do we need impact factors and should we throw that, that whole thing away. Um, so I, I think they're, they're respected well now. There's you know, the PLOS journals and, and there's also another series that's more geared towards um, genomics and bioinformatics, the, the BNC journals. So those are all fairly well respected. Okay. Right. So many, uh, yeah, and obviously many journals are imitating uh, PLOS One's model because uh, PLOS One has done so well. And actually I think PLOS One's impact factor is going down a little bit. But for example, you know, Nature has sort of Nature Communications and only online <coughs> journal and lots of the other uh, there's PNAS Plus, um, there's lots of these, uh, the high, very high impact journals are now creating, trying to make a high impact online journal as well. And I'd say for rank and tenure, it's evolving because um, one of the issues is that there's lots of new metrics out there as well that people are reporting in their tenure packets. And sometimes there's a couple of members on through the rank and tenure committee who understand these metrics, <coughs> and the rest just think that's all nonsense. Um, but it's evolving as those, you know, because this very senior scholars from a variety of disciplines, some are involved in this and some aren't. And so it's incumbent actually on this <coughs> rank and tenure committee for those few people who do um, understand what all these different metrics are whether it's, you know, H index, and the, there's all these different, you know, indices that are there, and they have to kind of convince the other members of rank and tenure, essentially, that these are, uh, that whether these metrics are valid or not, and they sometimes argue about this. Um, so they do, you know, they, they do, so when people don't report their, own, their metrics in their rank and tenure packets, packets or different types of metrics, there are often members of, you know, that will go and look them up and do it themselves. Or they, even their external letters, people will look at, at their, that are writing for you, and those letters are probably the most important feature of any rank and tenure packet. The external reviewers um, will often look at their, look up their metrics and talk about them in their letters as well. So it's getting into those rank and tenure packets, whether you like it or not, whether people like it or not, and how they get interpreted, though, is it's still uh, is still a moving target, so to speak. So uh, I don't think it's people who report them obviously value them. People who don't report them, somebody might look them up who does value them. So it's it's actually better to always kind of be aware of your own metrics and check yourself out constantly, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, to, to map that. So there's somebody I might have had a comment related to this, but yeah. Uh, I just wanted to comment that from a librarian's point of view, open access is kind of lumping a whole bunch of things together. Right. And, and it shouldn't be thought of that way because there's a broad spectrum there. Are some very good open access journals, peer reviewed, they meet the quality of the highest print journal standards you've ever seen. Right. And then there are other companies out there who are soliciting, come, you know, put your put your paper in and there's no editorial plunk your money down. Plunk your money down, yes. There's no editorial review, there's no peer review. So to me the publishing it's the quality of the journal. It doesn't matter if it's print or if it's open access. That's You're right, right. But it is confusing for people because many of them aren't Well the, yes and they sort of originally I think got equated with Vanity Press. Just mm -hmm. you know and it's really it's evolved way beyond that. Right. So Hindawi is one of the big online right. publishers, and 
But some of their journals have done pretty well, and some of them haven't. So I think it's a kind of, it's a real mix. And it's waiting through that mix. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. I just want to relate a thing when you're talking about somebody, whether that's had any, anybody study studied the effect of not English and non-Western publishing in these areas, whether there's, that's changed the way we, like in some disciplines, <coughs> stuff from South America that was discovered decades ago, it's just disputing North American anthropology, let's say. Does that kind of thing seem to be opening up? Does anybody been studying that kind of? Um, I know less about, um, about anything outside of computer science with regards to that, but in computer science, a number of journals are coming up in Asia. So it's, there's a feeling amongst Asian um, scholars that their work is not regarded as highly in the English print journals because of just English issues as opposed to the quality of the ideas themselves. And so we're starting to see a lot more um, interdisciplinary t or, or multilingual types of journals that are arriving. But I don't think US um, scholars are publishing in them. I think this is going to cause some type of long-term issue where we can't read Chinese and or another language and we're we not going to know what some of these concepts are. Um, but I do think that open access is part of the reason that's driving that. It's, it's making it larger in our discipline. I think in biology right now, and probably for the last um, English is the currency. So I, I feel like um, if, if those individuals don't publish in an um, English journal, then it's not going to be noticed. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit because you know, the topic is talking about the internet. And with the internet and with a lot of the, the really high speed um, you know gigabit networks now um, I'm, I'm a little surprised I haven't heard any of you talk about moving and accessing big quantities of data in, in this way so just be interested to hear your comments on that. Um, so I work in the area of large data like that so so it's, it's definitely true when I started at Georgetown and I was working with large data, people would send me tapes and tapes of the data and I would then get it on the hard drives um, and that's no longer what's as necessary to do. Um, so, so I think the internet without question is the reason that we have access to such big data. The way the speeds of the internet have increased um, at such a rate that I would not have expected it to increase that had you asked me 10 years ago. Um, and I think because of the rates of increase we've had, I actually believe in another decade, the types of power that we're going to have just on our phones is going to be huge. And it's going to impact research even to another extent um, in terms of availability of data and also in terms of analytic tools that exist to actually analyze and manipulate that data very, very rapidly. Right now, a lot of the analytic tools that exist um, are, are very slow and are still um, probably subpar to what a researcher fully needs to do everything they, they want to do with data. Um, I think we're very lucky. This is an exciting time. Lots of data is being generated. We need to understand the quality of it. It's a big issue. There's no measure of quality of data on the internet. Um, but once we look at some of the quad quality types of issues and we understand um, what is good and what is bad and what we can rely on and we have reliability scores that are meaningful, I think it's going to even go to a whole new extent in our research. I think all researchers in all disciplines are going to have exposure to um, large data. And funding agencies now require for proposals that you have data access or a data plan or at least open or open access and for any data that are published in a journal 
you're supposed to make those data accessible to anyone who asks as well. So, um, but you're right, the data quality and interpretation of the data, you know, tremendous, it's a tremendous issue. You know, nobody, if we put all our dolphin data online, um, yeah, I don't know how people would interpret a lot of the things that are in there. And uh, they might come up with some interesting things, but it would be a challenge. That's a, it's actually a problem for the microbiome project right now because a lot of the uh, there's there's discussions at the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Should we keep every sequence of everything? As as especially as we continue to create more and more data, what how are we going to organize that? Is it do we complete everything to the same level? Um, we we've been running into some problems with uh, one of the projects an undergraduate in the lab is doing, um, when they first started sequencing bacterial sequences, they would do what's called finish them, which means that they make them into an entire chromosome. Now it's just chunks of DNA. And how do they fit together, we don't know. And so one of the students is trying to figure out which of the chunks, the genes that she's interested in, on, is supposed to be. So, um, so that's been a little bit of a problem for us because they have made a conscious decision not to have as high quality data available as, as they used to. Yeah. And obviously there's security issues too. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of data security issues. Yeah, yeah data integrity is huge right now because, um, you know, if somebody changed an element, what would you know? I, I was curious, Lisa, about the Twitter data. I mean, how did you get that? And how can you track that back to individual people? And can anybody do that? Or did you have special dispensation to get yeah, this? Data? Yeah. So um, Twitter has an API, um, which is basically a way for you to access their data set in a way they allow it. Okay, so, so, okay, first of all, computer scientists for a very long time, and I, I bunched myself into this too. We just scrape the data. I mean, if it's on a public page, we can just very easily write a crawler, scrape it. It's really, you know, an undergrad can easily do that. It's not a big deal. Um, however, I have a large interest in privacy, and so I attempt to only use APIs now, which means that the company has decided that this is the way that I'm supposed to access data from your site. And um, these APIs <coughs> allow you to um, with one query, get a whole lot of information. Now, Twitter does have um, caps on the amount of information you can get per day. And they also have something called whitelists, which means you're, you're paying us or you're important in some way, so we're going to let you access more of that data. Um, this particular data that uh, we did with Nancy Pelosi um, was just through the API. And all we did was we were looking at Nancy Pelosi's tweets that did that see, they, they'll tell you how much kind of, if they were retweeted a significant amount. We looked at them, we, we took her followers, we then looked at those followers, and we built out a network for a few hops, and then we looked at how tweets disseminated across that network. It's an enormous amount of data. Mm -hmm. It's enormous amount of data processing for someone who's not in computer science, but with, you know, we, we do that a lot. So, um, so I have a data set that's actually been publicly released by a researcher in Korea, a Twitter data set, that has um, hundreds of millions of Twitter users and, um, and a few billion um, edges between them. So if you want to look at dissemination, you can. Twitter data, unlike Facebook data and some of the other um, social media sites, is all public. Another reason not to tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're trying to get your idea. <laughs> be careful what you tweet. Right. You really do need to be quick, careful what you tweet. So while you're on that topic, it just sounds like you're not looking at individual identities when you're looking at the friends of the friends or the retweets, right? Any comments on the NSA and looking at meta what they mean by metadata? <laughs> or just looking at metadata, is that a similar thing that you're doing with just looking at Disseminations? Yeah, so. Should we be so, just trusting of them? <laughs> <laughs> I hate to get into politics. It's always a difficult um, topic. But, but um, 
So a lot of computer science researchers develop algorithms, right? And they develop these algorithms to either, like in my case, see how information diffuses across a network, understand um, how often there are these hubs that exist and how they um, impact if you if one of them was disconnected how does it impact the, the flow of information through the rest of the network we develop algorithms based on not just you know something ad hoc but trying to see whether or not we can measure this in a very smart way and then um, use that to understand some level of human behavior okay um, in order to do that we do have to have a certain type of data um, I do believe that anonymizing the data in a very intelligent way is an important thing to do. I don't think that we should not be doing that step, and I don't think we should be collecting data that is private, um, just as myself, I don't think that. Um, having said that, if you are not using the details of the information, uh, you can um, still do a lot that can be meaningful with it. And the phone records thing is something, I, you know, I, I, it's my own phone too, and I'm not sure I, I, I feel like that was a good thing to do. But I do think that um, you would be amazed, even if they didn't take your phone records, what they could find through the public information in your GSA. I mean, like, they could have done it a smarter way without ever touching your phone records. And, and so, I'm sorry, this is even going on a different topic, but so what they did was, you know, was incorrect in the way they did it. Had they done it a different way, it still could have ended in the same result. I mean, there's just a ton of information about you out there. In fact, we have a project here at Georgetown that's called the Web Footprint Project. It was um, sponsored by NSF, and what we're attempting to do is develop a tool that helps users understand uh, how easy it is to pull information from a lot of different sources to generate these profiles and then to identify ways for them to reduce their information exposure that exists um, on the web. I think tools like that are really important. I think most people have no idea how easy it is to find public information on the web. You just put together your white pages with mm -hmm. your Twitter, I know none of you have Twitter here, we've all you know, figured that out, but with your Facebook, with your Google Plus, with your LinkedIn, you just do a few of these and you'd be amazed how much information um, can be collected. And now that everything's geotagged, I can also tell where you were at all the times so in your life. Sorry. <laughs> so I think, um, we should wrap, wrap up. Uh, so I'd like to say I really appreciate the panel's wonderful thoughts. Um, and I thought they were really thought provoking and great stuff. Of course, the dolphin stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have Lisa. I grabbed her early before everybody else tried to grab her. So. I'm stuck with her, but she's just yeah, stuck with me. I'll never let her go. So thank you so much for coming.